that's actually better than presenter view. If you can try play from the beginning on that one, see how you get on. No, it's not. It's not clicking. Yeah. Right. Leave it at that. Right. that. That's better than presenter view. Leave it at that. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Thank you all for your patience. So um, I took the title of the seminar from um, a well-known quote by C.S. Lewis, uh, where he talks about grief being likened to a long valley, a winding valley where any bend may reveal a totally new landscape. And it was that sense of landscape that appealed to me in this presentation because grief is not a formula and the way that we process grief um, and as we see when I present some of the studies on grief, it's a matter of perspective and landscapes that open up um, as people deal with their grief and journey through it. An opening definition of grief to begin with uh, from Margaret Holloway's Negotiating Death in Contemporary Health and Social Care, a very simple definition of grief and grieving as being descriptions of the individual's psychological uh, and emotional responses uh, to loss. And an interesting quote from Francis Weller uh, from an article that he wrote about the etymology of the word grief. The territory of grief is heavy, he says. Even the word carries weight. Grief comes from the Latin word gravis, meaning heavy, from which we also get grave, gravity, and gravid. We use the word gravitas to speak of a quality in some people who are able to carry the weight of the world with a dignified bearing. And so it is when we, le when we learn to carry our grief uh, with dignity. I thought that was a nicely put etymology of the word grief. Now, many of you will be familiar, of course, with um, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, whose book on death and dying proved very popular in the 1970s and 80s and 90s uh, because she put her finger on the pulse of something that, that grief has a number of phases or stages, if you like, and this become, became a top-selling book. And other authors um, following Kubler-Ross also talked about grief in terms of stages. She identified five in particular, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Um, and other theorists came up with more stages or sub-stages within those stages. Uh, but as time went on, uh, that theory of grief following set stages came under increasing critique and question as people related it to their experience and found that their grief did not follow a linear path. Uh, in fact, they bounced back and forth between the various stages and often the stages uh, were only approximate in their description of what they were going through. So other death theorists and people that were um, working in the area of grief uh, began to talk about different models. And I'll just talk about one or two of those that um, became quite popular. The dual process theory by Strobe and Schutt, 1999, uh, talked about this oscillation between loss-oriented um, perspectives and grief and rest restoration-oriented. In other words, as a person grieves, they oscillate between these two phases, as it were. In loss-oriented phase, they're dealing with grief. Uh, they're having to let go of certain things. They're having to, to just go through that whole grief process. But equally in the grief process, they're also beginning to talk about a future. What does the future look like? How does life change? What new patterns and habits do I need to um, appropriate and, and get used to? And so Strobe and Schutt in their um, theory said, there is an everyday life experience, there is this oscillation between a loss-oriented phase and a restoration-oriented phase of grief. Then there was the continuing bonds uh, theory, Dennis Class in 1996. And what he wanted to tackle was the notion that uh, in grief, you healthy grieving involve letting go. And so grief counselors very much at the time were into encouraging you, you've got to let your grief go, let go of what's holding you back so you can embrace your post grief future. 
And a quote there from Dennis Class, for many bereaved people, maintaining connections with a loved one who died is a key aspect of their ongoing functioning and contributes to their adjustment. This counters previously held wisdom that healthy grieving involves letting go. However, it is not simply enough to cling to these former attachments for that can result in maladaptive grief. The attachments must be transformed. Uh, so it's not a matter of wallowing in those, in the sense of grief and the past connections, uh, nor is it just a matter of letting go, but somehow it's a bit of a both and. David McNeese, writing some years later in 2013, used the image of a circular staircase by which we move between a room of loss where bonds are severed and a room of restoration where bonds continue. And he particularly was interested in the process of pastoral care in response to grief. And he said that pastoral care is the process of encouraging the bereaved to live in the whole house and not become trapped in one part. So the if you like, the task of the pastoral carer is to not only encourage that dwelling in the whole house, but to, where possible, accompany as appropriate uh, people to discover there are different houses or different rooms in this house or habitation of grief. So those were some of the main theories that, uh, that took hold, moving on from the linear um, stages of grief theory more to nuanced theories of continuing bonds and oscillation between loss orientation and restoration orientation. And then more recently, a lot of um, authors on grief and uh, specialists have talked about particular types of grief. Not all grief is the same, so it's very difficult to fit into a particular framework. So I'm going to look at some of those particular kinds of, of grief that don't necessarily fit a particular pattern. The first one is the notion of um, complicated grief. A number of uh, authors have, have talked about this. Complicated grief that is not routine or ordinary, doesn't follow predictable patterns. And the, the definition here is people respond very differently to traumatic events such as a death, often making it difficult to identify signs of debilitating grief. But debilitating grief is where the symptom distress is excessive, it's prolonged, and it is seriously functioning debilitating. And uh, many of us will identify with that either having gone through it personally or having um, journeyed with someone who has been absolutely debilitated by the grief process that they're going through. And there are various um, symptoms that can be um, that can show themselves during this process and the diagram there lists some of them from intense sorrow and pain uh, to constant thinking about it a numbness a detachment a loss of meaning and purpose of life inability to enjoy life or carry out normal routines um, often a sense of guilt that you've contributed somehow to the person's death or the loved one's death and is feeling despondent or wishing you died along with a loved one. And when these symptoms go on for quite some period, often more specialist intervention is required or needed. And uh, that's where grief therapists and so on can do a lot of work. So for the, the average pastoral carer, dealing, uh, helping someone that's experiencing complicated grief will take them beyond their area of um, expertise and what they're able to give necessarily. So that's where referral is very important. Um, a number of authors talk about disenfranchised grief. Disenfranchised grief being a loss that is not openly acknowledged, socially validated, or publicly mourned. In other words, a loss where society itself fails the griever by simply not recognizing their right to grieve. Uh, and so we're all familiar with grief that follows death and the major losses in life, um, but there are often other forms of loss that cause us grief, but because they're not as well and publicly recognized, we tend to suffer more alone and, and that's what disenfranchised grief is. So some examples there of of where um, a loved one is suffering from dementia and you, you experience as their um, spouse or partner, 
this um, just ongoing deterioration and the grief that actually starts before the person has died, but during that long process of deterioration. But not everyone, who do you talk to about that, that may understand just how real that grief is and can be? Uh, it might be a loved one that's got a an addiction, uh, drugs or alcohol or something like that. And of course, there are programs that can be referred to, but there can be a real grief within the family of trying to help someone with an addiction. Infertility, term termination of pregnancy, breakup or divorce, death of a pet, redundancy. Through our lives, there can all be, uh, there can often be significant moments of loss that trigger grief, but often friends and family don't really understand um, what we're going through. And there's just a sense, oh yes, we understand the loss, but time to get over it, time to move on. It's not like, an actual death and so on. So um, as pastoral carers, we need to be aware that disenfranchised grief, grief is very real and can manifest itself in quite a number of ways. Pauline Boss, uh, an American um, psychologist, talks about uh, ambiguous loss. And she put out a book a number of years ago called The Myth of Closure. And she's just produced a, an updated version of that called The Myth of Closure, Ambiguous Loss, in a time of pandemic and change. And so this is written during the period of COVID-19 because she says the pandemic fits into that category of ambiguous loss. Ambiguous loss, she said in 2010, takes two forms. The first occurs when a loved one is physically absent, but psychologically present, as in the case of a missing person, and often military families where they may have lost uh, a loved one who's lost in action, um, at, or someone that's lost in some tragedy and that the body has not been recovered. They don't know whether the person's dead or alive and confirmation of death has not been received. The second, she says, occurs when a loved one is physically present but psychologically absent, as in the case of a person suffering from dementia. Traditional therapies are insufficient because closure, the usual goal in grief therapy, is impossible. Uh, so she's saying that ambiguous loss can also, for a lot of people, be very acute and very real. Another specialist area in literature is uh, to do with suicide grief uh, because of the intensity of it uh, and because of the so many complicating factors around suicide for, the, for the, uh, the, the deceased's family and friends, the feelings that it triggers in them. Um, and so suicide grief, I've summarized here, is a form of complicated grief because of the complexity of feelings associated with it and the tendency for the sorrow and pain to remain unresolved. Those feelings may include guilt for not having done more to prevent the deceased from taking their life and for having missed clues to their intentions. Confusion from being left with unanswered questions. Anger at the deceased, not just for taking their life and abandoning those that loved and cared for them most, but also for being plunged into a state of unresolved grief and guilt. And finally, loneliness as the bereaved experience, the stigma that suicide still carries for some people and feel that some friends and family to whom they would usually turn for support do not really understand what they are going through. Uh, so um, suicide itself is a specialist area of grief research. Another significant one in recent years is parental grief. Uh, and here I've quoted from Nicholas Walterstorff's book, um, Lament for a Son, and I could have chosen any number of dozens of quotes. It's such a profound little book that and Nicholas Walterstorff wrote following the death of his beloved son, Eric, who died in a mountaineering accident. Um, and it effectively became a diary of his thoughts and reflections as he journeyed through this long, um, that, this long period of grief following the death of the son. And I've included two quotes here, which I think are significant. It's so wrong, so profoundly wrong for a child to die before its parents. It's hard enough to bury one's parents, but that we can expect. Our parents belong to our past, our children belong to our future. We do not visualize our future without them. 
how can I bury my son, my future, one of the next in line? He was meant to bury me. And sometimes I think that happiness is over for me. I look at photos of the past and immediately comes the thought, that's when we were happy. But I can still laugh, so I guess that isn't quite it. Perhaps what's over is happiness as the fundamental tone of my existence. Now sorrow is that. Sorrow is no longer the islands, but the sea. And that last sentence grabbed me by the heart when I read it. It's such a profound um, acknowledgement, uh, recognition of the way things are. Sorrow is no longer the islands dotted around but it's actually become the sea in which I swim. Um, and that's what parental grief is like. Uh, there is also, um, following on from this, a lot of research now on parental grief in relation to newborn babies and stillborn babies, uh, recognizing that this has become a specialist area in and of itself. And I'd have to say as um, one who lost their grandchild who was still born um, a couple of years ago, how impressed I was with the, um, with the care that was offered by the hospital, uh, the midwife, and the pastoral support networks that are out there for parents uh, and family that are going through these forms of grief. Things have come a long way from where they were even 20 or 30 years ago. I remember in my first parish being asked uh, by a woman who had lost her stillborn baby um, 20, 30 years ago uh, before I came on the scene and she'd kept the ashes. And she said, uh, at the time of the stillbirth, the death was not really recognized uh, the gr the, or the, the grief was not really recognized and she'd held on to the ashes. But finally came the time when she wanted to lay those ashes to rest and she'd been feeling the weight of this for 20 or 30 years or so. So um, I think as a society, we're learning to put much better support structures in place now uh, for people that often go through these forms of, of grief. Um, so the landscape of grief, I think, is very broad. A lot of the writing has moved on from, if you like, overarching theories of grief. Uh, more to looking at particular forms of grief. Grief, a much more anecdotal approach to situations of grief and saying, what can we learn, not just from the theories and the systems, but what can we, can we learn from the stories and, and how does that shape um, our understanding of grief and the processes of pastoral care? So I'd now like to turn the focus to pastoral care, horizons of care, which is the second part of the presentation. And I've identified six areas here that I think are important and can be helpful for us when we're involved in ministries of pastoral care to those who grieve. Perhaps the first and most important one is a ministry of presence. It's a well-known phrase within the field of chaplaincy studies. Uh, but I love the phrase with Mick Walterstorff in his book Lament for a Son when he talked about what was unhelpful, where people came to him and said uh, rather trite phrases are, at least you've got other things for which you can be thankful or this time will pass and, and you will get through this. And he found those sorts of sentiments totally unsatisfying pastorally. Um, and he coined a phrase which I thought was wonderful. He says, what I want most from people is for them to come and sit with me for a while on my morning seat. That's, what, that's the phase, that's the situation he was, and he just wanted presence. Uh, he didn't want just more words, but just that solidarity of presence. And as pastoral carers, perhaps that's the most important gift that we can give. I do like the writings of Storm Swain. Um, she uh, studied and taught theology here in, in New Zealand, and now she's in the United States. Storm put out a, a wonderful book following the tragedy of Ground Zero and, and the, um, the, the Twin Towers collapse with the terrorist um, plane bombs. And 
uh, she, as a chaplain at Ground Zero, she reflected on her time afterwards and wrote a book on pastoral care and theology uh, called Trauma and Transformation at Ground Zero. And she tried to hold on to a Trinitarian understanding, not only of God, but a Trinitarian process of pastoral care. <clears throat> and in her book, she talks about three, um, if you like, movements. They're not linear phases, but they're movements. Earth-making, pain-bearing, life-giving, which she anchors in the biblical narrative. Um, and she talks about the, these different aspects of pastoral care. Earth-making is really holding pattern. It's the theme of creation, holding, making space for, um, for creation and affirming identity um, and simply being there um, and, and affirming a person's humanity uh, in their grief. Pain bearing is entering more deeply, the deep listening, listening to the pain, listening to the unspoken messages that are being communicated and being there as they journey through that pain. And it's really that empathetic phase. And then the life giving is to look to that, look to areas where hope can be articulated, uh, where promise can be affirmed uh, and so on, which in the Christian sense, we would link to resurrection hope but she did not want to reduce it to a formula. Uh, but these are the different, if you like, phases of pastoral care that she wanted to identify. And I think her book is very helpful. Um, two authors uh, that I read um, in this, in this uh, field of grief talk about the importance of death competence. Uh, what do they mean by that? Death competence means that if you're dealing with people who are grieving um, someone who has died, Death competence means you have to have a basic understanding of the processes of grief and death and all the things, some of the things of which we're talking about uh, tonight. But more important, it's also a matter of having come to terms with your own situations of loss and grief and death so that uh, you're not, if you like, caught out um, where suddenly as you're dealing with a pastoral situation, you find a whole lot of unresolved stuff in your own background being triggered and coming to the fore. So that aspect of dealing with one's own um, history, uh, insecurities, uncertainties, uh, is all about building that death competence. And it doesn't mean that, that, that you end up with a qualification or a point at which you've reached it. It's an ongoing process, but you need to be aware of it to say, what is this triggering in me? Um, Another author uh, talked about the need to identify signs of resilience and help build resilience capacity. He said, um, we fall into a trap if we think that everyone who is experiencing grief is somehow incapacitated or suffering. Often there are many layers of resilience already there and people actually cope in different ways. There are coping mechanisms that people have internally and part of the pastoral care task is not simply to empathize or sympathize with, but it's to help people identify their own wellsprings of resilience and coping mechanisms and to affirm those. So it's not, as I say, not just comforting, but it's resilience identifying and building. Um, a fifth aspect that I think is important is the role that faith communities play, and a number of authors talk about this, liturgies, music, prayer and ritual. There's something about the use of ritual and symbol that speaks in ways that words cannot. Um, and that's why often, so often after a, uh, after a particular tragedy, um, a, a well-conducted and well-planned service of some sort with the use of symbolism can be very um, helpful pastorally for help, helping people process uh, what's going on. The faith community can be very important for just that bedrock of community support for the people to know that they're not um, in this alone, that there, are, that there are resources they can call upon and they're part of the community. <clears throat> and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in the next slide. But the final bit is a sense of collaboration. In the field of pastoral care, always looking to work collaboratively with healthcare professionals, specialists, with whānau, uh, with everyone that's offering some kind of wraparound support for those who are grieving. 
so that we don't necessarily carry more of a burden ourselves, nor do we supplant others that are playing an important part in the healing process for those who grieve. So it's a collaborative ministry, a collaborative, collaborative exercise. I want now to talk a little bit more about uh, the role of faith. Some of us will be familiar with John Calvin's well-known quote when he referred to the Psalms as an anatomy of all parts of the soul, because the Psalms are prayer poems, if you like, songs uh, that the Is ancient Israelites would sing, and they've entered the church's lectionary. And even though we no longer sing them or recite them to the same extent that previous generations did, they're part of the... Um, the liturgical and pastoral resource that's at our disposal uh, within the church. It's the church's hymn book and prayer book, the Psalms. And I was reading recently a very good article by John Whitfleet, who, um, uh, who is a North American author and theologian. And he was reflecting on the role of music and prayer in pastoral care, and particularly in times of joy and sorrow. And he talks about two dimensions of prayer. He said there is expressive prayer, and he gives the example of um, if, as a child, uh, you um, do something naughty and you're told off, you might cry out in rage of the injustice of it all or whatever. That's the expressive side, the spontaneous outburst of emotion and feeling. But then he said there's also a formative action. If your parent tells you that you must apologize and return the toy that you've taken from your friend, it might be the last thing you feel like doing, but you know you've got to do it. Uh, and you somehow, and that's the formative aspect where there's a gradual alignment of mind and heart and will to something we do not yet feel. And John Whitfleet talks about the Psalms in this category. Not only do they convey the full array of human emotion and feeling from joy and celebration and thanksgiving to confession of guilt and lament and sorrow, so that's the expressive side that we can tap into. But there's also something very important about regularly um, immersing ourselves, reading and praying the Psalms, even when we do not feel the emotions that are in the Psalms, because they actually have a formative aspect uh, for us. They are forming us in the way of, in the way of prayer. And there's this quote uh, from John Whitfleet. The point of ritual prayer is not ritual prayer itself. In other words, we're not just praying because we have to pray. We don't pray formative prayers so that we can pray formative prayers. We pray formative prayers so that the spiritual muscles they exercise will work on their own, so that the affections they cultivate will equip us for deep friendship with God and each other, so that, so that the sensibilities they awaken will help us become God's healing presence in the world. God so loves. We pray formatively to plant the seeds that will be harvested in expressive prayer, faithful Christ, Christian witness and service to God and each other. Here's the key bit. Formative prayer is preparing us for the day when the same words and melodies and rhythms that stretch us today will be expressive tomorrow. What I liked about that quote is it is affirming the habits of faith and the habits of worship and the habits of prayer um, that actually prepare us for what happens further down the track. So as we familiarize ourselves and as we recite, for example, the 23rd Psalm in worship, there will come a time in our own personal lives where we're not simply reciting it because that's what we're doing as a church community, but the words have somehow soaked into our very um, psyches, as it were, and during a tough time when we ourselves find ourselves walking through the darkest valley, suddenly Psalm 23 comes alive in a very powerful way and becomes a very important uh, tool for us, a spiritual tool. And I guess part of the task of pastoral care is not only encouraging uh, people to, to see this formative aspect of praying and learning to pray, uh, but also drawing on those resources when our own spiritual resources run dry. 
I remember one incident in my pastoral ministry days where I uh, was invited um, in to see a woman who'd just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. And she said, you know, she, she acknowledged she was spiritually and emotionally bereft um, and she, she was not coping particularly well. We talked around some of the dynamics of that. And she asked if there was anything I could recommend that might be helpful. So I said, well, I don't know if it's going to be helpful or not, but here's something. You're familiar with Psalm 23, and, and we'd actually prayed it together during the pastoral visit. I said, why don't you simply make it your daily task to pray your way through Psalm 23? It will be your daily walk and your daily prayer. And perhaps if you feel inclined, why don't you maintain a little bit of a diary that records your walking through this darkest valley with the psalmist and the Lord is your shepherd. And on particular days, there might be some parts of the psalm that speak to you more clearly than others. There might be some days when, when your own prayer resources are utterly um, dry, uh, but the words of the psalm will sustain you. And then over time, you'll be able to look back and just trace something of this journey you've been on. So she did that. And for her, that was a very helpful um, uh, pastoral exercise to go through, through a very difficult time of uncertainty and coming to terms uh, with her own mortality and what the future would hold. Uh, so I think that's what made me resonate with John Whitfleet's um, analysis there of, of the Psalms and Kelvin's understanding of the anatomy of the soul. Some of you may have heard from a good uh, friend and colleague, Lynn Barb, in recent weeks and recent months, where uh, she's one of the most prolific authors of books of pastoral care. She's well familiar with the situation here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And she's just published a book called Two Hands, Grief and Gratitude in the Christian Life. And in fact, I read uh, the book today, uh, and it's a, another wonderful little book. And in it, she quotes uh, Francis Weller, who in 2015 um, wrote a book on, on grief, the edge of sorrow, uh, and he included this quote. The work of the mature person is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other and to be stretched large by them. How much sorrow can I hold? That's how much gratitude I can give. If I carry only grief, I'll bend towards cynicism and despair. If I have only gratitude, I'll become saccharine and won't develop much compassion for other people's suffering. Grief keeps the heart fluid and soft, which helps make compassion possible. And Lynn in her book looks not only at the Psalms, and, and I think she illustrates so well what John Whitfleet was drawing out about the Psalms being the anatomy of the soul, where she looks at this, the Psalms of Lament, where even inside the Psalms of Lament, there are expressions of thanksgiving and gratitude for the good works of God and who God is. So this sense of lament, sorrow, grief, um, going hand in hand with gratitude, expression of joy. Um, but she also looks at other biblical passages and themes in the Bible which make the same thing. So it's a very, the book constitutes a very nice series of biblical studies on this theme of of grief and gratitude, and I think would make a very good study resource uh, within parishes on that score. I now want to uh, turn my attention to some um, modern developments, if you like, in grief, ones that uh, have arose more specifically in recent decades uh, that we are coming to terms with as a society. The first is vicarious grieving. And I guess the, the, in, the event that most uh, writers on this subject point to the most was the death, death of Diana, Princess of Wales. And just and the photo there is of all the, the flowers that were left at Kensington Palace. Just this um, expression of grief that consumed not only the nation in Great Britain, but also the Commonwealth. There was a sense in which she was this larger, larger than life figure and when she died, 
it triggered such an outpouring of grief almost on a global scale. It was quite remarkable. And, and this happens more and more in the social media age where through the media, um, tragic events are publicized so widely and so quickly and uh, people respond vicariously. And I've quoted from one author on the subject, Scott Sullender. The media has grown dramatically in recent years in variety, speed, and, in and intensity of information. Thus, the media's coverage of both real and fictional death and trauma has increased the instance of vicarious grieving and vicarious traumatization by the viewing public. Accessing the human innate capacity to empathize, the media invites us to share in the sorrow of, sorrow of others and to bind together in times of collective tragedy. At the same time, the intensity and scope of the public's exposure to unnatural death might be creating a generation that is actually less sensitive to the needs of others. So what he's beginning to identify um, in that study is uh, that there's a whole lot of stuff that we're beginning to, to have to unpick in relation to this vicarious grief and come to terms with. A similar um, phenomenon is online memorial culture. <clears throat> Tony Walter uh, reflects on this. Pervasive show social media in which users generate their own content have significantly shifted mourners' social interactions and the norms that govern them, partly in new directions, such as enfranchising previously stigmatized griefs, more potential for conflict between mourners and others, but partly returning to something more like the relationships of the pre-industrial village, such as everyday awareness of mortality, greater use of religious imagery, more potential for conflict among mourners. Online mourners can experience both greater freedom to be themselves and increase social pressure to conform to group norms as to who should be mourned and how. Now, what that and other studies go on to say is online now, there are just dozens and dozens of online support groups for people going through various types of grief, grief, whether it be suicide, parental grief, uh, and those support groups are not just localized, they're global, and you, you link into a group. Now, on the one hand, that can be hugely beneficial. Um, but on the other hand, those groups can also have their own internal um, norms for what's acceptable and what's not acceptable in terms of what you're allowed to post and what you're not allowed to post. And that in itself can sometimes create uh, tension because not everyone grieves in the same way. But uh, so what a lot of the research is on this memorial uh, culture identifying is that uh, it's not all um, harmony and light. There can be real uh, tensions that develop within the memorial culture. And in a similar way, grieving for a Facebook friend. Uh, Natalie Pennington in 2014 wrote this, Online communities such as Facebook that are forced to grapple with and confront death become important areas to study to understand the evolution of grief in a computer mediated world. It is not just the friends and family that are impacted by the passing of a young person and online memorials provide the opportunity for anyone who was touched by the deceased to communicate their grief and seek support as needed, regardless of how much time has passed since the user died. Uh, so again, exploring that. One of the things that a lot of these researchers are identifying is that as grief is, um, is expressed online, there it's a very eclectic mix of sentiments that are and can be expressed, um, some of them appropriate, not appropriate, but also an eclectic range of beliefs about death, about the afterlife, about suffering. Um, and for faith communities, Christian communities, for pastoral carers that represent religious traditions, um, we're often having to grapple not only with the particularity of our own training, formation, faith, tradition, perspectives on grief, death, and dying, but we're having to mix within this very eclectic milieu of, of, of so many beliefs all being thrown together through social media and online. And that's part of the reality in which we are now operating. Two things to close with in the, in the presentation part. 
I stumbled across an online art project by a Canadian artist, Mindy Strick, who documented dozens of people's grief journey. And she asked them a basic set of questions, um, not only a little bit about their story of grief for circumstance, but she asked them to identify an object, if they could choose an object that described their grief or a color uh, or something like that, what would they choose? And then she's a photographer of her background. When they chose an object or something like that, she would get a photo of it. And so the art project, which is online, um, is, is a fascinating collation of anecdotes and wonderful photos that again highlighted for me the fact that um, death and grief uh, form a landscape, uh, not a theory, not a framework. So I've said their grief landscapes depicts grief not as a prescribed set of steps or timelines, but as a place with no clearly marked paths and exploration of new territory. And I thoroughly recommend that website uh, to you. And then finally to close, a poem by well-known New Zealand author, Joy Cowley. And I've used this occasionally myself um, at funeral services, grief. For most of us, death appears as a fixed horizon and those who pass over it leave an emptiness we must fill with a season of grieving. And yet with our sorrow, there, there is also a knowledge of light, a certainty that the sense of loss belongs not to any ending, but to the limitation of our vision. Death is an experience for those left behind, not for those who are moving from one stage of living to another. It is the Christ who dwells within us, who is free to step back and forth over the horizon of death, containing our grief and his passion and our knowledge of light and his transcendence showing us that death and resurrection are the two sides of the one coin. So while the grief goes on, the tears, the hurting, I know in the truth of Jesus Christ that the hollowness I feel at the departure of loved ones is in reality the hollowness of the empty tomb. We'll just come out of the recording. <clears throat>